but this is 68, so we're redoing it uh, today. Let me get through some of our housekeeping notes if I can. We have our sponsor, HET, as you well know. Uh, we're a, a, a private practice here in uh, Texas, predominantly up in the northeast section, section, but down in the southeast, the so northwest, southeast, and also in the med center. Uh, if you have an interest in perhaps joining our uh, growing group, please reach out to us at HET.us. Love to hear from you. We have very strong uh, perfusion services, ECMO services, and autotransfusion services. Also, social media. Make sure you like, follow, share, subscribe uh, on the YouTube, the FaceTime, and the Twitter. Give us the thumbs up and click the bell icon for notifications. Our websites, perfusioneducation.com and perfweb.us. And we're going to be doing some neat stuff next year, expanding that. We'll talk about that here in a second. You want to contact us, it's contact at perfusioneducation.com. You see it right there. We got our call in number. When you see this go up, you can call in live. MediWeb app uh, that you can go to the Apple app, the uh, Apple, uh, the app store or to the Google Play Store, and you can find it. We have a critical care app for uh, ECMO patients, perfusion patients. It's really good for getting all your stuff. Are you using the app? I'm sure good. Um, I will talk about that here in a second. Hemodynamics, clinical calculators, and IV calculator. There's also a standalone app, which is the IV calculator. So if you are a perfusionist and your friend or significant other is a nurse in the critical care unit, that's a really cool app. Um, and it's actually selling better than our clinical uh, uh, care application for perfusionists. So you guys, the perfusionists, need to catch on here and start buying more of mine because we've got a little competition going with that. Um, also, our podcast, go to your favorite streaming software, podcast streaming software, and just put in PerfWeb, and you can listen to our programs live while you're driving or, or recorded, whichever the case may be, while you're driving your car. Um, Please, you know, if you have a tendencies for road rage, don't listen to our podcast because sometimes we can be very controversial and provocative, and I don't want anybody getting mad and driving their car into other people while you're listening to uh, the uh, Perfusion podcast and my opinions about some things. Anyway, I am joined today in the studio with my great colleague, Ramsha Azmat. Ramsha is a graduate of Rush University and uh, where she did her perfusion training. She is also now a certified clinical perfusionist, having aced her boards on the very first try, and uh, I think you've maybe even reset now the bar that people have to achieve. Um, but uh, she is a new graduate with us, and she is independent, and she's just doing an outstanding job, and she's going to be talking along with me today on DO2, and uh, then in a little while, we're going to be joined also, because we're going to be doing PerfWeb 74, so 68 is now, this is the one that I previously canceled, and then we're going to be doing PerfWeb 74, which is our last one for 2021, and we're going to be joined by Bill Watson, and I'll introduce him when he gets here, and we'll talk a little bit about him, but while I'm just sort of discussing it before we get started with these lectures, Tell us about your new experience, your feeling about having passed the boards and having that big certificate that says American Board of Cardiovascular Perfusionist, you know, that, that you are now a certified clinical perfusionist and can use that initial, those initials after your name. How does that feel? Man, it was a big dream come true. Mm -hmm. I remember starting three years ago, no, four years, I think, or three years ago when I figured out about perfusion, I interviewed with someone in Dallas and then I went crazy after that. This is what I wanted to do after that. My parents wanted me to go towards like becoming a doctor and I wanted to do something in per um, cardiology. Mm -hmm. But when I figured this out, I was like, I just went after it and it became my dream. That's all I wanted to do. And, and you have a very strong, you do, you have an incredible passion yeah. Um, for this uh, industry, and that's why I feel so humbled and proud that you work with us. Thank you. Um, but I remember that in the very early days of your quest, you were uh, calling me 
um, seemingly incessantly because you wanted to shadow. Mm -hmm. And I remember setting that up for you, getting mm -hmm. you to where you got to do that. And uh, you shattered a couple of times. Yeah. And uh, then the next thing I know, I'm getting a call from you that, hey, I'm going to be graduating from Perfusion School. Um, are you hiring? Yeah. And uh, I can tell you, we, we happened to, at the time, mm -hmm. have a position available. Uh, but I, I'm feel, I feel confident in saying, getting to know you the way I have, and sort of how I noticed mm -hmm. your tenacity at the time, um, you know, your determination was very remarkable. Even if we had not had a position available, I was going to hire you anyway. Aww, so I don't want to <laughs> tell you that, though, because now you'll be asking for a raise. I don't, I don't want you to do that. So, uh, no. But anyway, you're doing a fantastic job. You but really honestly, are. And I'm, I'm so incredibly proud of you. Perfusion was never for money. It was more for my passion. I Absolutely. wanted to do this for more of my passion because I was just like, once I saw the cases, I felt like that's where... I was meant to be mm -hmm. in that OR. Mm -hmm. I felt so safe. I was like, this is where I need to be. Well, I'll tell you, you know, I have not seen, um, and I, I don't want to, you know, I'm sorry that I'm just sort of disgusted talking, but I think it's, it's important for especially younger perfusionists that may be out there listening to us right now, um, that in all of the time that I've been in this industry, you're uh, one of the very few people that I have seen come directly out of school and in a very short period of time be to the level you currently are where surgeons are that we work with that are quite difficult and demanding and fast. They're great surgeons, yeah. but they're, they're, they're demanding. Um, but you have uh, already developed quite a reputation amongst our surgeons uh, that everyone is very comfortable with you being in their room and, and working with them. So you know, that takes, uh, that takes a particular kind of person. And for your, you know, diminutive size and relative quiet voice, um, you, are, uh, you are very well respected in that operating room and uh, very comfortable. Uh, the surgeons are very comfortable when you're doing their cases. So my compliments to you for that. Thank you so much. You're more than welcome. So do you want me to go first? Or do you want to go first? And it doesn't oh. much matter to me. I'll let you go first, and then mine will somewhat tie to yours. Okay. But it's a little bit off, kind of. A little bit different. Different. So it dovetails into yours. Okay, yes. so good. So we'll go ahead and do, uh, d is there anything I forgot, David? No. No? Okay, good. So I've covered everything. So now we're going to jump right into uh, DO2. So we'll go with our slides. So you can see them okay? You're yes. good? Okay. And uh, just a quick question, if I can, David. I'm sorry, Mermadric. Is that monitor just supposed to be like that, or is it supposed to be something else? I'm just not. I want to make sure that the stream is going right. That one over there. I just want to make sure that we're. Yeah, we look good. So that other monitor being that, it's that's okay. 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 So just ex just ignore that one. All right, so I want to give some acknowledgement to a Dr. Uh, Lundy Campbell and John Trite and John Ingram, uh, perfusionists, for uh, their contributions to this particular uh, uh, talk that I'm going to give. I got really so much of my information from them. Um, a lot of the stuff that Dr. Campbell and Dr. Trite have, uh, have published and also uh, John with his programs that he does, Knowledge Nuggets and participating in PerfWeb, he's really taught me a lot uh, about things and gotten me interested in things that I might not have really known a lot of, you know, uh, as much about as I probably should, right? It's the one thing I'm, I, have with, I have absolute certainty of, and that is that your, your certification, my certification, renewal certification, whatever, is really a license for us to learn yeah. because this, 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 you have to continue to try and learn or you can just get so far behind in this industry and, you know, you don't know what's going on because things change so incredibly fast. Um, early observations with, so this is uh, from an article, and I wanted to point this out, that it's chest in, uh, in December of 1988. And what I wanted to bring this up for is, We've been talking about DO2 for a very long time. Oxygen to the tissue is not some new revelation that we are now, you know, 
talking about or wrestling with or deciding, you know, what's best. We've actually been looking at it for a very long time. And Schumacher uh, and others, you know, Dr. Rivers, Manny Rivers up in Detroit, I don't know where he is now, but he was in Detroit for the longest time, um, but, but Schumacher first. But they've done incredible work at looking at DO2 and survival, but more in the emergency room and the critical care unit. But I think so much of that can be uh, correlated to what we do in the operating room. Because in my view, cardiopulmonary bypass really is a controlled shock state in my view. And there's a lot of things going on. We, we're there to perfuse the patient, but we're also there to facilitate the operation being done. And if you're overflowing the patient, not getting good venous drainage, and they can't see to do the operation because the field is flooded, well, we have to make decisions. And then sometimes those decisions are lower flow. And how long can we tolerate this for? What's going to be the impact of it? How can I adjust the DO2 so that I can tolerate a lower flow? Do I need to do something with temperature? So we're going to go through all of these various different things. But he was looking at shock survivors. And he noticed that survivors of septic shock achieved higher values in cardiac index, oxygen delivery, oxygen consumption, and that they had much lower oxygen extraction levels. The underlying assumption that maximizing DO2 would increase, DO2 being delivery of oxygen, would increase VO2 or utilization of oxygen and reduce tissue hypoxemia. So the question from uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Campbell and Dr. Kreit is, does Schumacher make sense? So it seems intuitive that improving tissue oxygenation would be beneficial. What level of DO2 should be targeted? And that timing of intervention is important. Now, we've talked about that, I can't tell you how many times on this program and many others, that with ECMO, historically, earlier intervention was believed to be much better in terms of survival. However, and with that said, ECMO on its own merit is not good for us. Yeah. So if I take a healthy patient and put them on ECMO, there's going to be a host of things occur, including very significant inflammatory yeah. response um, and high risk of other complications, mm -hmm. stroke, thrombosis, pulmonary mm -hmm. embolus, uh, uh, inflammatory systemic inflammatory response syndrome, bleeding, uh, you name it renal failure, there's all kinds of hepatic congestion, there's all kinds of things that can happen. ECMO is not good for us, yeah. but it is a tool to be used in certain circumstances. And historically, we've, just, we've thought that earlier intervention is going to improve outcomes, but, with not, but, but keeping in mind that it has inherent risks means that if you put a patient on ECMO too soon, you could actually hurt that patient. That patient may not have ever needed ECMO, yeah. may survive the, the respiratory insult, but now they aren't going to make it because we did put the patient on ECMO and a, uh, a, uh, 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 a uh, uh, complication ensued from that. So I think we need to be aware of that. So patient selection, is it says may be important, but I think that it is very. ultimately very, very important. It's not may be important. Patient selection is critical in these in any kind of of significant uh, uh, medical intervention, high, really high tech medical intervention. Does affecting oxygen delivery matter? Well, there's many varied and conflicting studies. They cover a wide variety of ICU patients, and they're all instituted at, very, at various times. And it makes the ability to really look at this data objectively and make sense of it very onerous, quite difficult, and in the words of the authors of this, a methodological quagmire. 
and we all understand what that means. It was very well put, actually, by them. In Schumacher's uh, original article, uh, I'll just read the abstract. I think it's worth reading. Survivors of high-risk surgical operations were previously observed to have significant higher mean cardiac index, DO2, and VO2 than the non-survivor. The hypothesis was proposed that increasing the, C the cardiac index and VO2 are circulatory com compensations for increased postoperative metabolism, and that makes sense. We tested this hypothesis in two series. Series one, prospectively allocated by services, mortality, morbidity of the control group was significantly greater than those of the protocol group. In series two, patients who fulfilled previously defined high-risk criteria were preoperatively randomized to one of three monitoring treatment groups, CBP control, PA control, and PA protocol group. And this was to manage fluid, okay? Actually, this was and fluid and continuous cardiac output monitoring at the time. Postoperative mortalities in the CVP control and PA control group were not statistically significant, uh, the different, but the PA protocol group mortality was significantly reduced compared with its control group. The PA protocol group had reduced complications, duration of hospitalization, duration of ICU stay, and mechanical ventilation. This was written in 1988 was far superior than just looking at blood pressure and filling pressure, the RA pressure, but actually being able to do, in those days it was probably cold hemodilution, but you could shoot cardiac output, you could do a wedge, you could see what the left side was doing. There was a lot of information you could get from a PA catheter that you cannot get from just a CVP. Essentially, the Schumacher was two very difficult studies in one, and this is, of course, coming from the author. Significant methodological issues, critical ill, non-cardiac high-risk surgical patients, the two groups, the protocol, control and protocol, each with its own hemodynamic goals. The controls, which you see here, was cardiac index, DO2, and VO2. In the protocol, the index was much higher, from 2.8 to 3.5, to greater than 4.5, oops, computer shut down, um, and the DO2 from 400 to 550 to greater than 600, and the VO2 uh, 120 to 140 or greater than 120 in the protocol group. All groups received fluid, inotropes, vasopressors, vasodilators as needed. Let me go ahead and restart my computer if I may. I'm so sorry. It's crowded up here, guys. Yeah, too much. And the glasses, I can't see. I'm trying to get all this done. I put my glasses on my head so I don't lose them. So next uh, talk. So Schumacher took 252 uh, patients and randomized them to control and protocol. And when started study period, and, uh, and when started the study period pre-op versus post-op analyzed patient mortality by subgroup, early versus late, control versus protocol, cardiac index normal at baseline versus elevated at baseline. In all groups combined, the control group had a mortality of 34%. In the protocol group, it was 19%. But in the patients that started off with normal pre-op hemodynamics, the control was 28% mortality, so far less than just in all groups. And the protocol, and for the protocol, it was 10% much lower. So if the patient has normal preoperative or pre-therapeutic, whatever we say operative, but it's not necessarily surgery all the time, could be just an ICU admission, we're just calling the interventions operative, you if you have normal pre-op hemodynamics, you're much more likely to survive than somebody who has deranged uh, hemodynamics in the beginning of whatever the intervention is going to be. Um, in the second series, 146 patients met criteria for the study. 58 were not randomized, 45 were not sick enough. It sp they split the remaining 88 patients into three groups. CVC, where it's central venous uh, uh, pressure, PAC, uh, which would be the uh, 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 pulmonary artery pressure, and the PAC uh, protocol group, which is the P 
PAC with supraphysiologic targets. So in the CBC and the PAC group, they went with normal hemodynamics. In the PAC protocol group, they did supranormal targets. So higher cardiac output, higher DO2, higher hematocrits, et cetera. The, and then they analyzed, and when you analyzed all of this for mortality, the central venous pressure group had a 23% mortality. The PA control group had a 33% mortality, but the PA protocol group had a 4% mortality. The ones that were non-randomized had a 38% uh, mortality risk. So you see by looking at the PA with the protocol and using it to drive volume administration and also inotropy support, et cetera, to try and improve cardiac output and index, you, by doing this, they show, and this is back again in 1988, but they show a very significant difference in mortality risk from 23 and 33% to 4%. That's a very meaningful set of information. So I think it really shows us historically how long we've been wrestling with this and how important it has been recognized for so long that oxygen delivery to the tissue is critical to our survival. So background, so I'm gonna go through some stuff. The background on oxygen delivery, which we already did, me, why measure oxygen delivery? Does affecting oxygen delivery matter? How to make sense of this and some recommendations. So a little background on oxygen delivery. Go over the terms, formulas, how to measure it, how to measure oxygen consumption, and how to measure cardiac output, cardia cardiac index. So in terms, oxygen delivery, DO2, is the amount of oxygen delivered to the body tissue in one minute. DO2 equals cardiac output, times O2 content. It's very simple, not very complicated formula at all. Oxygen consumption, the, con the utilization of, uh, of oxygen, is the rate of oxygen removed from blood for use by tissues. VO2 is measured by calorimetry, and the formula is cardiac output times the uh, arterial oxygen content minus the venous oxygen content, and that is a thick equation. Oxygen extraction, or EO2, is the slope of the DO2 divided by VO2 relationship. It's often expressed as O2 extraction rate. Uh, we, we use that, and that's actually in our app. You can actually look this up. It's, very, it's a great, like I said, it's a terrific app. You are using the app, right? Very good. You're doing good. You're, you're, you can stay with the company another, another month. Okay. Um, often expressed as O2 extraction rate, and that formula is CaO2 minus CbO2 divided by CaO2, and it's normally 25 to 30 percent. So then that makes sense, right? What's your normal SVO2? Your normal SVO2 is 70 to 75. That's 25 to 30 percent. So your extraction rate is about 0.25 to 0.3. That's normal. And when we flow, when we're perfusing, and we're measuring continuous uh, venous saturation, we're looking for that. When it gets under 70, down 68, 66, 65, I don't know about you, but I start getting a little bit nervous at that point in time. And so that's sort of um, uh, telling me, hey, I'm not really flowing enough on this patient. On its own, it's probably really not enough. Uh, because in a, in, a, in, a, in a vacuum, any one of these things doesn't necessarily mean a whole hell of a lot. You always have to take everything into totality. And what can we tolerate as a, as a, as a human? You know, what, yeah. what can the patient tolerate? What can we do to improve it? Um, all these things. Oxygen delivery not measured directly. Um, DO2 equals CO times CaO2. We talked about that. Here's the formulas, basically. That's just the form. Normal values, 1,000 mLs per minute or 500 milliliters per meter, meter squared. So there's your, your oxygen delivery formula. Here is your formula for oxygen consumption, and it's about 3 mLs per TIG or about 250 mLs per minute, which would be 25% of the 1,000, which we just talked about. 
And this is now a very important slide. So I want to take some time to talk about this one. I've kind of blown through that previous part, but everybody should really already understand that. That was a very uh, uh, rudimentary review. So what you're looking at here is, and if you look in this area here, this area here is a supply-independent oxygenation region. And what that means is that anything from this point forward is going to be luxurious. And what I mean by that is if you are just at rest, this is going to be fine. But once you start moving around and exercising or something else is going on, you're going to start uh, using more and more and more. And if you have oxygenation out here, you have this reserve to play around with. So that's why I call everything over here luxurious. It's more than you need. But if you follow this line here coming across from A to B to C, you notice that it starts to drop off. This is a supply-dependent oxygenation. And what this is going to do is, if you notice, your O2 extraction is down here around 20%. Then it's here at 30%. Your extraction goes higher, 40 and 50 and 60%. And as this continues to fall, your extraction rate goes up and your lactate starts to increase because you are no longer supplying sufficient oxygen to the tissue for aerobic metabolism. Now you're getting into the anaerobic metabolism phase. And so if you're, and I'll talk a little bit about exercise, but this is basically what happens to an athlete. As you look at this line with an athlete, athletes can get this line all the way out to here before it starts falling and it doesn't fall quite as fast. Eventually it will and their muscles will fail. But in just normal everyday people like you and I, once you get to a certain point, where you are no longer supplying enough oxygen, and here's your VO2 down here, 500, 1,000 being normal, and you get low enough, your, oxygen, your extraction rate goes up higher and higher until you're basically no longer able to extract enough oxygen from the tissue, and you, be, you develop a lactic acidosis, and uh, things go downhill from there. Here is another way to look at the same thing. The red line that you see down here is lactate. The blue line that you see here is extraction rate. And if you watch the extraction rate, and down here you have oxygen delivery. You see that right here in milliliters. Uh, and you have oxygen consumption here. So as you can see, as your oxygen delivery goes down, going from right to left, and reaches a critical DO2 point, it falls off the cliff. And intersecting with that, as you can see, is your lactate levels beginning to rise. So it makes sense if you have an elevated lactate and you believe you have reduced cardiac output or oxygen delivery, more importantly, because you can have a great cardiac output and not have enough oxygen carrying capacity, which is a different issue, which we'll mm -hmm. talk about. But you can see it stands to reason if you have an elevated lactate by improving improving oxygen delivery, you can help clear that lactate and reestablish a normal physiology. Uh, as far as the exercise is concerned, VO2 max is very important. And what is VO2 max? Obviously, it's the maximum amount of oxygen that your body can utilize during exercise. And there's all kinds of ways to resolve that. Now, I'm not going to say who this biker is, but hey, I'm not accusing anyone. This is the, 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 the person who's the, uh, who's the uh, uh, viewer. I'm not accusing anyone of anything. I'm just saying he never even slows down, the, uh, slows down on the hills, and it raises red flags. And you can see a bag of blood <laughs> that's being administered to the cyclist. And so for those of you who don't know, this is what Lance Armstrong did. He <laughs> took his own blood, he stored it, and then he gave it to himself so that he had a higher hemoglobin while he was racing in the uh, Pyrenees Mountains. And that gave him a much higher VO2 max because he had higher oxygen carrying capacity. Mm -hmm. So 
hemoglobin is so important when we're talking about doing bypass surgery or valve surgery or major aortic surgery, whatever it is. It doesn't make any difference what you're doing. Yeah. You can't just look at your flow. You have to consider what is the oxygen content of my blood and that I'm flowing. And then you also have to take into consideration what are the patient's metabolic requirements at this moment. Am I cooling? Am I cold? Am I warming? Is the patient light on anesthesia? Um, or, you know, were they shivering or anything like that? There's so many questions you have to ask yourself before you can just assume I'm flowing enough or I'm not flowing enough. Because, again, in a vacuum, that just doesn't tell you enough. So a lot of people, and I've seen it before, they won't flow under an index of 2.2. Well, sometimes you can't get the operation done, and we are there to facilitate the operation. That's the second part of being a perfusionist, because really my question is, why do you need a perfusionist? Well, you need a perfusionist to be able to make these decisions mm -hmm. that are going to make a big difference as to the patient's outcome so that the surgeon can do the operation and have a good operation that's going to be successful at the same time keeping the patient alive, keeping them neurologically intact, keeping their end organs able to work. So there's a lot going on. When, you do, when you're a perfusionist versus just hanging out and just being there while they operate. There's yeah. a lot of decisions that have to be made, and it happens so fast. Yeah. Uh, I'm not even discussing the critical care unit because that's a totally different thing. But it's important, too. So how do we control DO2 and VO2? Well, you can increase oxygen content, increase the hemoglobin, increase the FiO2 if they're hypoxic, if their PO, if their saturation's only 90, you can make their saturation 100, that's going to be very important. And there's a formula, I think there's a formula coming up. But of course, saturation's what's important in terms of your oxygen content. There's very little oxygen dissolved in the plasma, it contributes yeah. to some degree, but very little. Um, you can increase the cardiac index. You can decrease regional oxygen consumption. If they're febrile, you can control the fever. You can cool the patient, whatever it may be. Control the work of breathing. If it is an ICU patient and they are not adequately sedated, they're shivering and moving, or they're, 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 they're breathing heavy. I mean, you know, when you become tachypnic in the ICU and you're not intubated and your work of breathing is so high, you basically just exhaust and you be go into respiratory arrest. So that's when somebody's going to be intubated. Um, you want to intubate them before that happens, yeah. but you're leading that direction. Um, or treat the reason for the tachypnea if it's some other reason. It could be cardiac, could be congestive heart failure, fluid overload, be a lot of different things. Paralyzing the patient obviously makes a huge deal. If mm -hmm. you're in the operating room and your patient is moving, even if it's just where they're not really seeing it, but they're so light they're moving a little and they're just not fully paralyzed, um, then that can be a real problem too. Yeah. So there's a lot of things you want to ask when you're in the operating room. Is patient light, paralytic still good, whatever the case may be, to make a difference. If you can control consumption, you can improve indirectly delivery, right? Then how do you measure cardiac output? Well, in the operating room, it's easy. We've got a flow probe, so we know what we're flowing, yeah. okay? And you always want your flow probe the most distal point from any shunt in your bypass circuit. Because if you have it proximally and you have that shunt open, you think you're flowing much higher than you actually are. Yeah. And so that's very important to remember. You always want your flow probe the most distal point. Now, if you're using a roller pump, usually you're just going to be yeah. counting revolutions and stroke volume, assuming that it's occlusive and no issues there. You don't have that same luxury because you do have a lot of shunts that mm -hmm. are going to be open for hemoconcentrator, possibly for uh, just a recirculation, your, your manifold for drawing your labs. There's going to be various different shunts open. And on a roller pump, you just have to know what those are. But uh, with a centrifugal pump, which I think is really more commonly used now. It's, uh, there are people who still use roller pumps, yeah. but you know, I, I, I haven't used one in a very long time. 
<laughs> not since I was, I think I was, no, I wasn't even Belize. Even in Belize, they use centrifugal pumps, thank goodness. Um, I would much rather use a uh, centrifugal pump than a roller pump. But you can do thoracic electrical impedance. I don't think that's worth a darn, but people use it. Minimally invasive, uh, you have lithium dilution cardiac output. That's like the LIDCO. You have pulse contour analysis, like the flow track system. And these are very good in the ICU because they're going to measure. You can, you can actually calibrate the LIDCO uh, with lithium dilution, but you can't calibrate the flow track system. Um, there's so much debate about these systems, whether or not um, they're really that accurate or not. I know some of the uh, docs that we work with at some of the hospitals call the uh, flow track, because that's the one that's popular here, the random number generator. Um, but, you know, it, it's, I don't know that that's 100% fair. I think they're fairly accurate devices. Um, and you're not only looking at pulse contour analysis for the cardiac output, you're actually looking at your pulse pressure and systolic pressure uh, variation under mechanical ventilation. And that can tell you a lot about the patient's uh, volume status. So it's, it's important to know that because, ma because uh, uh, making the, uh, optimizing the patient's intravascular, intracardiac volume status is very important, uh, especially in the critical care unit, obviously, to uh, 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 having the most ideal cardiac output that that person can generate. Um, so it really helps to optimize cardiac output, cardiac index. But it can be used in the operating room as well because when you come off bypass and you're closing, you want to know what that patient's volume status is because that's when yeah. a lot of shifts are going to occur. You then have invasive, which is obviously esophageal Doppler monitoring, which is a gold standard. You have transpulmonary cardiac output, pulmonary artery catheters, and uh, you have SCVO2. That's the superior vena cable uh, oxygen measure, uh, 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 content measurement, and that sits in the jugular bulb. Mm -hmm. And that's a much better indicator of cardiac output than a mixed venous. So, because it's more specific in the uh, in the uh, superior vena cava, and it's giving you a better indication of what the brain is actually seeing at that time. It's a little more accurate as far as uh, because your lower body might not be using much oxygen, so you know you're going to end up with a mixed venous saturation. It doesn't look all that bad, but your SCVO2 might be really low, and that's clearly a problem. So you want to know that. Um, why measure oxygen delivery? Well, shock states and shock physiology has demonstrated to us that it's a very worthwhile thing to do. There's also a cycle of dyxioxia, or dysoxia, excuse me, which I will show you. Early observations of shock and critical illness and improved survival. So what is it that we care about in shock? And that's obviously blood pressure and oxygen delivery. And as I told you from the very beginning, when you go on bypass, you're basically in a controlled shock state. It is a controlled state of shock. You're going, you're draining the heart out, you're, you're, you're not draining the venous capacitance system, but you're emptying the heart, you're transitioning from continuous flow to pulsatile, uh, from pulsatile flow to continuous flow, you're hemodiluting the patient, the pressure tends to drop down, you know, is it going to a mean pressure, and we usually have to, there's all kinds of things that are happening, the baroreceptors go crazy, the chemoreceptors go crazy, um, all of these things are, you know, the viscosity is changing. All these things happen. You tend to see hypotension. We treat it with phenylephrine. We get the pressure back to normal again, and we accept this for relatively brief periods of time. But, you know, I mean, there, there, there are still periods of time where the body is experiencing a, uh, a, a very unnatural uh, environment, and I think it's something that we uh, – we don't do really good ones. You know, back in the old days, I'll tell you a quick story if I can. We used to do this, and, you know, we would mix. And so they would cannulate the right atrium. They would cannulate the aorta. And then what we would do, of course, at the time we were using bubble oxygenators, but we would drain a little bit of venous blood and then give a little bit of crystalloid arterially and do that slowly over time until the entire system was completely full, so we very slowly added aliquots of crystalloid into the patient, so it wasn't a 
go on bypass and you have this 30 seconds of nothing but crystalloid going into the patient. Now, because that's what happens, right? You've seen that happen many yeah. times, right? With do it with ECMO. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in fact, I, I you know remember that. Oh, you. I think I think you were there. I think it was Lydia that was there. But we changed an ECMO circuit out, and what I did, the patient was very unstable, and I was certain the patient was not going to tolerate. He was going to code uh, if we changed the ECMO out. So I used a unit of PAC cells in the ECMO, and uh, I uh, pH adjusted it with bicarb and recirculated it in the ECMO before we made the change, and the guy didn't have any issues at all. Um, but if we had done it with just crystalloid during that, and I've done it before, where as soon as you go back on ECMO, before the blood gets through the system, the patient codes, and yeah. you're having to resuscitate them, and then they come back. But uh, if you can avoid that, you should, and that was the way I chose to do it on that particular day, and it worked fine. Okay. Um, so there's a lack of adequate perfusion, urine shock, leading to cycle of cell dysfunction, which leads to decreased ability of cell, cellular oxygen consumption and use, leads to cell death, and eventually you have death of the organism. And this is basically the cycle of dysoxia that I talked about. You have decreased cardiac output, which leads to a decreased VO2, which leads to cell dysfunction, which leads to decreased oxygen consumption, which or utilization, which goes back around again, which further depresses the index, and this whole thing goes around in circles. So this is the cycle of dysoxia. And this came right out of uh, Dr. Kreitz's uh, 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 chapter in textbook um, of critical care, and if you and he's uh, from Kentucky, and if you look here, you have DO2, which is arterial oxygen content and cardiac output, remember? And to increase content, you go over here, you can increase the hemoglobin, increase the saturation, increase the PO2, and over here for cardiac output, you can either increase the heart rate or the stroke volume. So this is just a little chart that shows you what your options are. These are the things, look, we're having a DO2 problem, I need to do one of two things. I gotta increase the cardiac output, how am I gonna do that? We can increase the heart rate, we can increase the stroke volume. And if that's not enough, we need to increase the arterial oxygen content or vice versa, you may pick one versus the other first. So it depends on the clinical situation, obviously, but if I increase the availability, the, the oxygen carrying capacity, then I'm, it makes sense given the same cardiac output, I'm gonna increase tissue oxygenation or delivery of oxygen to the tissues. Everybody understands Starling's curve. You increase filling and you have a curve. You increase stroke volume and then eventually it levels off and over time it will come down if you overfill. What inotropes do is increase that stroke volume from where it would be to where you have it. So this is gonna increase by increasing preload with inotropy, you can improve your stroke volume, thereby your cardiac output and DO2. Um, this is a case, I'm gonna skip this, I'm not gonna go through this. Um, this was the uh, solution to that, we talked about that. Um, so correlating this to perfusion, do we flow enough during CPB? The question really should be, do we optimize? So. What's your thoughts on that? Do we optimize our flow during our standard cardiopulmonary bypass procedures? Well, doesn't that just depend on cardiac index? Yes, and so the VSAs? answer, simple answer to the question is no. How yeah. do we, how, how we manage our ECMO patients? Many VV patients are in fact in septic shock. They, uh, many of them are, go and we see it a lot. Temperature management, so important. Should, how far should we be cooling them? Should we be cooling them? Certainly we don't want them to be febrile. You have to hook a heater cooler up to them, but a lot of times they get cold and you gotta warm them up because there's, you know, then we can have problems with hypothermia. But how far can you cool them when you need to? And should we? Because that increases infection risk. There's a lot of things going on there that uh, I don't have all the answers to. I've got a lot of questions. I don't have very many answers to be honest with you. Temperature management, important. Types of monitoring. Do we measure DO2 routinely? Do we measure VO2 routinely? No, we really don't, do These we? These are not standard of care. They that it should be. They don't, yeah, but, but, yeah, but we don't. 
I yeah. mean, you know, we, 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 sure. our calculated flow is X. Based yeah. on what? Is it based on DO2? No. No. no? Well, so why isn't it? Shouldn't we know what our, what, our, what our bottom line DO2 should be for this patient? Um, and then do we optimize that? So you're doing a case. You're flowing along at an index of two. Everything, your labs have been great. You're, 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 you're riding high. You're going to be out by noon with no balloon. It's all great. And then some, you're warming, and something goes a little haywire. And they're like, you got to get your flow, you turn your flow down, turn your flow down. I need the flow down. So now you're warming and you're warmer. And you're at an index of two. Your hemoglobin's eight. The patient, okay, they're obese, older, not much in the way of exercise, probably going to tolerate this for a little while. Mm -hmm. How long? We don't know. Do we measure lactate routinely? No, no. probably not. We probably should, mm -hmm. I think. I think it should be. In fact, if you use the Siemens Rapid Point, which I have been pushing and promoting for I don't know how long now because it's the best device out there for intraoperative blood gas analysis, much better than the iStat or even the EPOC. I don't like the EPOC. The same company makes it. The EPOC, the EPOC is made by Siemens. I don't, I, I don't like the device. I like the 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 more benchtop model, mm -hmm. but it's small and you can move it around, you know, with a cart and whatever. It's just not a handheld, uh, but it gives you lactates. Yeah. Every lab it gives you a lactate. It's so simple, and I'm probably the gem does it too. I'm not mm -hmm. sure. I know the Siemens Rapid Point does, but I like the Siemens Rapid Point because it reads potassiums up to 18. Mm -hmm. Now, why the hell would you want to measure a potassium up to 18? Well, when we do the systemic mm -hmm. hyperkalemia, minimally evasive mitral valve technique. Well, you get potassiums of 13 pretty routinely, and if you're using an iStat or some of the other devices, they only go to 9. Yeah. But I need it higher than that because I want to see how fast it's coming down when I start removing it with the CVVH. But do we really optimize? You know, we hear, have people talking all the time about goal-directed perfusion, goal-directed perfusion. I'm actually going to have a talk done in June, and um, the person, a, a, a very, very credible person who can give this talk very well, is going to be talking about goal-directed perfusion. But what are the goals? What are the goals? How do we, you know, I mean, we talk about it, you know, reduce circuit size and uh, less hemodilution. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I think we should all try to have as small a circuit as we can. Should we wrap? Should we ultrafiltrate? You know, I'm very much against wrap. Yeah. A lot of people are very for wrap. You know, and we, I mean, we agree to disagree on that. Um, but there's so many other aspects to what we do that goal-directed perfusion is sort of an ambiguous term that's being used and thrown around to be like, ooh, we do goal-directed perfusion. But what are the goals? What are we doing? What are we trying to do and why? And does it matter at the end of the day? I think it should. Yeah. Probably does matter, but I don't have an answer for that either. Um, this is on the kidney, uh, so I think what I'm going to do in deference to time is I'm just going to go ahead and stop there and uh, ask uh, Ramcha to ask me any questions you'd like and uh, from my talk, and you can criticize it if you'd like, um, but I'd take some, crit critical, cr some, 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 some constructive criticism um, or any questions you may have or anybody in the audience may have. No, I think you did a really good job um, explaining DO2 and VO2 because I will be a kind of elaborating, not really, mm -hmm. but I think you did really good. Thank yeah. you. Okay, good. So you give me I learned. You learned something? Yeah. What'd you learn? If I you learned something, tell me what you learned. <laughs> you don't ever say something to me and not expect a question back. I learned about that um, graph that you were showing me. I was not able to understand it, but now I do. Because you I mean the, the, the DO2 versus uh -huh. VO2. The oxygen-dependent versus yeah. oxygen-independent. Yep. So luxurious perfusion versus mm -hmm. just barely enough or yes. not enough. Well, good, good. I'm glad that that was useful. Okay, so now you are going to go right into your talk, and mm -hmm. I know I'm going to have a million questions. I have a paper and a pen to write them down, <laughs> and you are going to be perf. Is it, uh, what's the title of your talk? It was adequacy of perfusion. That's right. Hold on. Uh, 
Okay, go to files and go to, oh, there it is, gotcha. Okay, and presenter view, do you have notes? Uh, I will just if they are, they're on the side. Okay, so do you know how to use this? Yes. Okay, so you have the pen if you want to draw, and if you push and hold, you get a, uh, a, a laser pointer. Okay. And then to change slides, you just go this way or this way. Okay. Okay, so I'll give you that. And you can either, um, you can move it all the way over there to you. Okay. So I'm going to be presenting on um, the adequacy of perfusion. And this is very debatable. And it's been questioned, especially as a new grad. When I was graduating and I was in my rotations, I was asked m multiple times, what should our flow be? And what should the cardiac index be? And I would always say 2.4, because that's what I was taught in school, in books, by a lot of professors and stuff. So always 2.4. But someone along the way, he was like, are you sure it's 2.4? Do we really need it? Does the patient really need it? And I like started looking at him like, I don't know. Why would you ask that? Like, I don't know. And so that's when um, he started breaking everything down for me. And he started giving me articles to read. And he was like, I want you to read this article, this article. So that's when I was like, we really don't need 2.4. Mm -hmm. It's uh, actually all dependent on the patient need and their metabolic requirement. Mm -hmm. So sometimes 2.4 can be a lot. And sometimes it can be less for the patient. So... Um, Two of the topics that I'm going to be covering is your bypass, blood flow, and then the parameters that affect that perfusion. So as perfusionists, we are mainly there to like perfuse the tissues and to adequately provide that perfusion and uh, to pretty much look at other stuff that you mentioned about, looking at their temperatures, looking at their metabolic requirements, their gas flows, everything. Pressures. Pressures. And uh, so historically, perfusion, uh, like their techniques were established in the 1980s. And in the 1950s, the flow rates were based on a cardiac index of 2.4 liters per minute per meter squared. And currently, the effective flow standards are right now 1.8 to 2.4 liters per minute per meter squared. And uh, the bypass flow rate of cardiac index Right now, it's like 2.4 to 3.2 liters per minute per meter squared. Man, that's we're a lot. 3.2? Yeah, and that's based on unanesthetic patients. So when the patient... Non-anesthetized yeah. patients. Got yeah. it. So when the patient is anesthetized, so they will definitely have a lower cardiac index um, because of their metabolic requirements. So now, how do we determine the flow rate? Is it on patients... Uh, body surface area or the cardiac index. But that's still an argumentative because we need to look at other parameters of the patient. Okay. Oh, so some of the parameters that I will look into is VO2, what Joe just covered, VO2, arterial blood pressures, their urine output, and then acid-base balance, especially lactate. So you already covered this a little bit. I'm just going to go over it a little. So DO2 is the total amount of oxygen delivery to the tissue per minute, uh, irrespective to the distribution of blood flow. Want to adequately deliver O2 to, to the mitochondria because it's your vital organ. And as you already mentioned, DO2 is equal to your cardiac output times um, the CaO2 was times output, times flow. Yeah, times your flow. So uh, on bypass, your cardiac output is your pump flow. Um, on pump, your DO2 is dependent on your hemoglobin concentration, your O2 saturation, pump flow, partial pressure, and arterial oxygen. Falls below the critical point, your oxygen consumption cannot be maintained using 
um, aerobic energy production, and then it further goes into it activates anaerobic mechanism to supply energy to the cells, which increases that lactate levels, as you mentioned before. And according to Renucci's um, new, uh, what is it called, study, your minimum DO2I, your index, is uh, 280 mils per minute per meter squared. Mm -hmm. First, it was 262, then they increased it to 272, and now it's 280. Mm -hmm. So that would give somebody with a, let's just hypothetically say, a BSA of 2, mm -hmm. 560 milliliters per minute of oxygen delivery to mm -hmm. the tissue. So now your uh, oxygen consumption, your global oxygen consumption, uh, VO2I, measures the total amount of oxygen con consumed by the tissue per minute. And you already covered the um, formula. I will just say the VO2 is 200 to 290 mils per minute. So now this is a little um, where the patient, they're looking at the conditions where the patient is like at certain temperatures, if it's anesthetized or an anesthetized, and what is the oxygen consumption per minute. So if the patient is 37 degrees Celsius with unanesthetized, the VO2 consumption is going to be 4.0 mils per kilogram per minute. And then if it's same temperature but it's um, anesthetized, it's going to be 2 to 3 mils per kilogram per minute. And if it is 27 degrees Celsius and it is anesthetized, it's going to be 1 to 2 mils per kilogram per minute. So when you're decreasing the temperature, your de one drop, one degree drop, will reduce um, the metabolic demand by seven percent. So if you're decreasing it by seven percent, I mean by seven degree drop, then it's going to be reducing it by fifty percent mm -hmm. or, or forty-nine. Yes. So one degree centigrade, centigrade drop, drop in temperature. So it is centigrade. Or centigrade, though. yes. Mm -hmm. And that's so important. That's why hypothermia. Mm -hmm is so important. Very important. Okay. So your DO2 versus your VCO2. There was a study that was conducted and I will talk about it in a minute. So this is your metabolic requirement in the of a patient. The ratio should be greater than five and if the patient ratio is less than five, then it's going into anaerobic respiration and it can cause acute kidney injury. So there was a study done by Sommer et al. that conducted um, to look at the association between metabolic parameters, your oxygen delivery DO2 and your carbon dioxide production VCO2 during bypass with post-operative um, AKI. So the study was a retrospective analysis of prospective collected data at two different institutions, the study um, population included 359 adult patients. The DO2 and VCO2 levels of each patient was monitored during bypass outcome. Variables were related to kidney peaking function, peaked post-operative serum creatinine in increase and stage, so AKI stage one and two. So in con conclusion, the DINAR uh, DO2 level during bypass is independently associated with post-operative AKI. The measurement of VCO2 related variables does not add it accuracy to the AKI predictor. So the experimental hypothesis was that the um, NADAR DO2 value and, and the DO2 and VCO2 ratio during bypass would be independent predictors of AKI. Most Multi-variable logistic regression models were built to detect the independent predictors of AKI and any kind of kidney function damage. And that is a big deal because, yeah. you know, y it's one thing to get the patient through the operation and they still have all of their faculties, but do they necessarily have kidneys that work? And that's so critically important, yeah. you know, you have that as a big issue. So pretty much like when you're CO2 is increasing than your actual demand, you're definitely going to be having um, like anaerobic respiration. 
and the first organ that shuts off is your kidneys. At that very, point. very sensitive to. In fact, that was some of my last slides. I just went ahead and skipped them. I'm glad you're covering it because that is something that we are. You know, when you look at when you look at acute renal failure following uh, uh, open heart surgery, it is absolutely, in my opinion, and it is unacceptably high. Yeah. It's very And uh, it's something that I think we need to address uh, moving forward. I'm sorry, forgive me for interrupting. Yeah, of course. No, I, I love it when you add in. Okay, so the DO2 versus VO2. So your oxygen extraction ratio, as you already covered, um, when the critical point of oxygen extraction ratio uh, reaches 60 to 70, it increases your VO2 or decreases in DO2 leads to tissue hypoxemia. And uh, it also is a good indicator of transfusion if it's above 40 is a good trigger. So well, this was I mean, the greater than 40, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, so you're saying you're, okay, so you're saying, not the hematocrit of 40, you're mm -hmm. saying that the oxygen, the the uh, VO2, DO2 ratio mm -hmm. of greater than 40 is a good trigger to uh, consider transfusion. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay, that makes sense. And you already covered this. This was something that I was actually put this on. I was like, I'm going to have you explain it to me, but you already did. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, I'll learn from you today too. <laughs> okay, so another thing that we looked at is our arterial blood pressure while on bypass. So arterial blood pressure is your pressure equals flow divided by your resistance. Flow times resistance, right? It's actually flow divided by your resistance. That's what I got. Pressure from equals flow times resistance. No, it's times. It's times? I'm sure. I mean, you just took the boards. I didn't, but I'm pretty sure it's, uh, hold on. I'm going to look it up. Okay. Go ahead. You can keep going. <laughs> okay. I got it from my notes. <laughs> okay. So having an adequate pressure to provide good blood and blood and oxygen to all of the vital organ, especially brain and the kidneys, is pretty um, well, important. Well, equation. It is times. It is times. I was pretty sure, but you know what? I'm never hesitant to not check. We got to <laughs> correct someone then. Well, wait, no, oh, no, pressure equals flow. Oh, no, flow equals pressure times resistance. Mm -hmm. Pressure equals flow times, keep going. <laughs> now I don't know. Now you got me confused. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, that's okay. <laughs> I should have just not said anything. Okay. Uh, so your optimal pressures on bypass is 50 to 70 millimeters of mercury. Again, that determines on your patient's metabolic needs and also their conditions. What like the core morbidities they have, such as if they have carotid stenosis, then you would want to flow a little higher. So yes. that's something that I was taught. Well, that makes sense. So if you have carotid stenosis, yeah, if you're running along with a pressure of 30, but you also have, I don't know how much they taught you about this, um, but you have a capillary opening mm -hmm. pressure right in the brain. Mm -hmm. So if you have this big drop in blood pressure, you go on pump and you have all of these capillaries closed down. If you only get to a pressure of 30 and you don't get any higher, you may not have a capillary opening okay. pressure sufficient to get that brain or any other organ perfused. Mm -hmm. So it's very important to get that pressure up. Yeah. But how we get it up? Do we use Neo or do we use Levo or do we use increased flow? That just determines. That's a good question, That's but good I mean, question. right, I'm asking you. So I would look at other parameters. I would mm -hmm. look at my SVO2 on pump. Mm -hmm. I will, if we use VO2 charts, which I totally believe that we should start doing, and I'm going to start using that into my practice now. Since I'm alone, I'm going to start that looking at your DO2, looking at other stuff, looking at urine output, that will tell me, okay, I'm perfusing this patient good enough with my flow, then I can just go ahead and give Neo. Okay, very good. But if there's some things that I don't see, then I'm going to be like, I might need to increase my flow. So now, um, 
and also some of the factors that af actually affect uh, pressures are like your anesthetic agent, vascular tones, hemodilution, and temperature. So all that actually plays into um, effect. So there was a study that was conducted in Stanford University where they used a flow of 1.0 cardiac index to 1.8 on their, um, and then looked at the neurological functions and they didn't find no problems. They didn't find like a single patient that had actual like neurological problems post bypass. Okay, I have to, I have to say it. What? You were right. <laughs> Flow is pressure divided by resistance. I think I'll just leave you alone now. <laughs> I'm gonna go, in fact, I'm going to go take a break. <laughs> it's okay. Hey, no, it's good that you're catching me. Because I didn't I'm catch learning you. from you, too. I should have just been quiet. Go ahead. I'm sorry, <laughs> sorry please. <laughs> I'm going to be learning from you, too, Joe. Come on. Okay, so urine output. This should be carefully monitored. I know some places they're like, this does not matter. But there has been studies where um, they said that if you are not perfusing 1 to 3 cc's per kilogram per hour, you are not adequately perfusing you the patient. You mean making 1 to 3 cc's per kilogram per mm -hmm. hour of urine? Yeah. So if you're not making 1 to 3 mLs per kg per hour of urine, then you are developing uric and, and you're not developed yes, you're not so uh, you may develop AKI. Yes. So oligourea develops when your urine output is less than 5 um 5.0 mLs per kilogram per hour and then urine less than 1.5 5 mils per kilogram per hour has been identified to cause AKA according to Huey et al. So it should be um, carefully monitored urine flow rates and optimized mean um, arterial pressure and bypass flow might be a mean to ensure that the re you're adequately perfusing your renals during bypass. So looking at your arterial flows and looking at your urine output. Mm-hmm. So I had a question for you from the audience. They use, uh, this is uh, David Tolaria, Tol no, t Toler, Toler, how do you say it? Tolaria, Tolaria, okay. I personally prefer to have a mean arterial greater than 70 in elderly patients um, with chronic arterial hypertension uncontrolled. Um, in your opinion, is this malpractice or is there evidence against it? No, I mean, no, I don't think there's no. mal. I don't think it's malpractice I at don't all. No, this is not malpractice, and, and uh, we have flowed higher in mm -hmm. patients with um, hypertension mm -hmm. because they sit there with a mean, mean a higher, higher mean arterial yeah, pressure. If, if the patient is sitting there like they're normal and you're flowing to that point, that's fine. Mm -hmm. And that comes back to um, I'm glad he pulled this up. That comes back to the cardiac index. Mm -hmm. Do we really need to flow that much? Because if a patient sits at a cardiac index, for example, 1.8. Mm -hmm. So if you were to see me, I would go around and ask the car anesthesiologist, like, where does this patient sit? Because that kind of gives me the clue that I don't have to really be flowing, you know, 2.4 or 2.5. Mm -hmm. I can flow less if a patient is super big or, you know, if there's a problem. So yeah, you don't perfuse mm -hmm. fat, really. Yeah, you don't perfuse fat. You don't. Not uh, much. Yeah, you don't perfuse that adipose tissue. So you can ask them where does this patient sit, where his baseline is, and then you can um, perfuse to that mm -hmm. cardiac index or a little higher if mm -hmm. you want. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. absolutely fine. Yeah, that's I think so too. Yeah. I think I, I'm actually uncomfortable, even with normal patients, with the mean pressure. You know much below 70. I'll yeah. tolerate 60, I'll tolerate 65 in certain people, but actually, uh, David, uh, I would I would prefer to have a, uh, a uh, mean arterial pressure of 70 the entire yeah. time. That's my preference. And I keep it around 60 to 80. And I know, no, I know of no evidence, you're welcome, I know of no evidence that supports um, running lower than that. In mm -hmm. fact, if it, it, I don't want to, I don't want to get sidetracked here. But if you go back again in history to Shumway, Shumway had the 30, 30, 30 rule. Yeah. 30 degrees, 30 cc's per kilo of flow, 
and 30 mean arterial pressure. And his outcomes were abysmal. So they abandoned that. But that used to be the standard uh, back in the early days of doing heart surgery. But they had s s too many strokes and too much yeah. AKI, uh, uh, acute renal failure and too much death. So uh, they don't do that. They, we learned very quickly that's not a good idea. So it was a 30 rule, 30, 30, 30. Yeah. So there's hopefully we answered. Yeah, and the baselines are very important to know. Yeah, know where your patient yeah. is, Sitting. where they, where they're, what their basal sort mm -hmm. of philosophy is mm -hmm. or uh, physiology is. If they're used to a mean pressure of 75, then why are we giving them a mean pressure of 50? Exactly. And being okay with that, right. Mm -hmm. If they have been living and actually walking around with a cardiac index of 1.8, why do we have to give them an index now of 2.4 under general anesthesia and hypothermia? Yep. It doesn't make sense, except they were an index of 1.8, and this is, I think, the whole point of this lecture, mm -hmm. is you're in an index of 1.8. But what's your DO2? Because yeah. your hemoglobin may be 13. Mm -hmm. Now your hemoglobin is 7. Mm -hmm. So you've cut it nearly in half. Yeah. So you may need that higher flow. So really, are we? why are we using these indexes to flow when we should be looking at DO2 mm -hmm. versus just this arbitrary number of my index? Yeah. Because that assumes a normal oxygen, arterial oxygen content, which we don't mm -hmm. have when we're doing surgery. Agreed? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. I totally do. I agree. And there's a lot of cases we do that have no urine output. Yeah. But because we also do really fast cases. <laughs> so that happens a lot. doesn't mean they're not making urine before, and it doesn't mean they're not making urine after. After, yeah. but sometimes when you have an hour pump run or an hour and 20 minute pump run, they don't make a whole heck of a lot of urine, mm -hmm. and we don't necessarily. We, I think we have the country as a whole has an unacceptably high AKI rate, yeah. but I can't say that lack of urine production during bypass or very little urine production during bypass has necessarily been the most accurate marker for me in my experience of a patient who is then post-operatively going to go into renal failure. So go on, I'm sorry. So then we also like monitor our blood gases during bypass just to check. So such as our hemoglobin, hematocrit, lactates, pH, um, base, excess, uh -huh. and then <laughs> PCO2, PO2, and SpO2. So some markers are very important than others, such as our lactates, but then even that can uh, kind of throw us off because it just depends on where we are in the case, such as like cross clamping or warming. Our lactates are going to be a little higher than normal. So I'm going to cover that in my next slide. Oh, well actually in my afterwards. So your venous saturation, SVO2, and mixed venous um yeah your mixed venous oxygen tension so uh your pvo2 is nor is a normal mixed venous oxygen tension which represents the balance between oxygen consumption and oxygen delivery which is usual around like 40 millimeters of mercury and your svo2 is a mixed venous oxygen saturation which is around 65 to 75 so now, are they a good mar marker of adequacy of perfusion? Um, they both, S PVO2 and SVO2 doesn't mean that cellular oxygenation is satisfied. However, if the distance capillaries are not equally perfused, tissues may not get um, blood flow, and as a result, your PVO2 or SVO2 may actually increase, mimically mimicking a vascular shunt. Therefore, they are useful and easy markers to measure, but they are not related to adequate tissue perfusion. Exactly, and I actually had mentioned that too. I had said that that measuring mixed, when we do our mixed venous coming down the venous line, that's looking at everything. Mm -hmm. 
whereas with the uh, with uh, Dr. Rivers, he does the jugular bulb because you're much less likely to have capillary shunting in the brain. Yeah. That's the one organ that's going to be so incredibly sensitive to uh, oxygen delivery and and consumption. So uh, yeah, you can have a you can have you can have all kinds of things going on peripherally mm -hmm. where you're not utilizing any oxygen yeah. for a variety of reasons yeah. with a microcirculatory derangement, and your SVO2 looks great, but it really isn't. Yeah. So SVO2 on bypass, as you mentioned, is or a whole. Or your perfusion is not good, right? Your yeah. tissue oxygenation is not good. As you said, on bypass, your SVO2 is like a whole body picture, but it does not give the regional perfusion of the tissue. Mm -hmm. yep. Very good. So now I'm going to cover um, lactates. So under anaerobic conditions, l lactate production results from cellular metabolism of pyruvate into lactate. Lactate level is an important and strong predictor of clinical outcome in patients undergoing bypass and in critically ill patients. So blood lactate levels in lactate levels in lactate acidosis are related to blood oxygen depth and the tissue per and is related to less tissue perfusion. So um, lactates above 4.0 millimoles per liter during bypass is a strong predictor of a hyperperfusion. Um, so there was a study that was conducted, and I'm going to like go a little bit and say something about it. <laughs> so that study was uh, conducted to just see the hyperlactemia, and they said that uh, Time plays a major role in when the patient seizes that hyperlactemia. Um, po and it was immediately post-operative where your lactate levels increase. Levels had worse outcome compared to patients who have developed hyperlactemia later after the surgery. So therefore, the timing of hyperlactemia early versus late may have different underlying mechanism and different impacts on clinical outcomes after cardiac surgery. So stress-induced hyperlactemia that is due to anaerobic glycolysis as a result of t tissue hyperperfusion, hypoxemia, or both. So um, however, recent studies link some forms of stress hyperlactemia to increase aerobic lactate production secondary to increase um, adagenic stimulation with or without decreased lactic clearance. Thus, it seems that not all patterns of hyperlactemia are harmful after cardiac surgery and that the timing of hyperlactemia is one potential co-founder of benign versus detrimental hyperlactemia. So another stu uh, um, study that was conducted by Argonary et al. found that not only time has an effect on hyperlactemia, but the event during bypass can cause um, hyperlactemia, such as your cross clamp, um, rewarming, and increasing in diabetes. So early lactemia after um, cardiac surgery was associated with increased morbidity and mortality. Late hyperlactemia was very common and had a self-timing and benign course. So I found that study very, in, like, very interesting because I remember at one of my sites we would measure lactates, and at points I would see the lactates rising. And question was why? So definitely when you're cro taking that cross claim off, your heart, um, the heart is ischemic, it's starting to wake up, you're going to start seeing that. So, uh, or otherwise at rewarming, now your vascular beds are opening up, so your blood is flowing through. You're getting some washout. You're getting that washout. From out. areas that yes. may have been hypoperfused. Yes. So you got to be very mindful of all these things. Are you really treating, are you actually looking at the cause? I mean, but are you actually looking at, like, the timing? Or are you actually just looking at the numbers? So just to be clear, because I need a little bit of help, I, I, I heard your the article um, but I w I'm not sure exactly what the message was. I want to make sure I get it. So a, so you're saying that an early lactatemia, mm -hmm. hyperlactatemia, is not harmful if it's in that context, or was it the late uh, hyperlactatemia? So the early is harmful. Harmful. Yes, but the late is benign. 
Okay, so, so when after they say late, so <laughs> early would be on pump to me. Yes, early would be on pump or coming off of pump. So, so such as like your cross clamping, mm -hmm. your rewarming, or I read um, that diabetes causes it too. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to look Because of microcirculatory yes. problems yes. with diabetics typically. So, so if you're seeing an elevated lactate on pump, you got to be very mindful of what events are you, where and are you? It. Yes. Where are you? Are you like, did they just cross clamp? Did they just take that off? Mm -hmm. Or are you rewarming? Mm -hmm. So you got to be very mindful and just don't take the action there. Just so be very mindful of but where you I'm are. Right. But what I'm getting confused about, and I am confused about it, so mm -hmm. you got to help me. So you're saying early mm -hmm. elevated lactates is harmful mm -hmm. is that because if it's caused by hypoperfusion or are you saying because i would think that if you have elevated lactates in the icu there's a reason for it mm -hmm. so but why is that benign i don't quite get it i'm, I'm having a hard time getting it so in that article it really did not identify mm -hmm. late perfusion i mean by late late Hyperglycemia, it just said. Hyperlactatemia. Yeah, I mean, uh -huh. by hyper, hyperlactatemia. Uh -huh. It just said that if it's after, I think, like eight hours of bypass, that's what it mentioned in the article. Okay. So that was a little confusing to me, too. But what I understood was the early during bypass was you're looking at certain events. So mm -hmm. you're keeping up with your case. So you're not just, you know, trying to treat it. Or trying to increase the flows or doing so something. So you're saying don't treat it if it's elevated during the case? Look at the event. Okay, so, so if the, ev let's say there's no event. So if there's no event, yes. then you got to treat it. Because it's hypoperfusion, generalized hypoperfusion. Hyper yes. You're not perfusing the patient adequately and the lactate's going yes. up. If there's some, so, so what you're saying is measure the lactate. If the lactate looks like it's bumped a little bit, and there's not another reason for yes. it. The clamp came, just came off. You're rewarming, whatever the case may be, yeah. that you should increase your flow mm -hmm. because you're not flowing on enough. this patient adequately. Yes. Okay, fair that's enough. That's I think I get it now. Okay. Hey, Magic, can I ask a question? I keep seeing on the YouTube these, uh, these like, crazy things. Is there something? Should we just delete these and get rid of them? Can you? Because I don't know what it is. It doesn't make sense. All right. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, that's that was about it that I looked into. That's it? We're done? Yep. These okay. These were some of the important things that I wanted to point out that I look at particularly when I'm on bypass. And also, just to wrap up, I would say that don't focus – on numbers, don't focus on the standard goals. Look at the entire whole picture of the patient. Mm -hmm. Look at if that patient, look at the pressures, look at their DO2, VO2, SVO2s. Mm -hmm. Look at everything that we actually mentioned about before mm -hmm. making any moves. So mm -hmm. should we be starting predicting um, what the DO2 on the patient should be? In other words, because we're doing an update on the app, right? Mm -hmm. And we have DO2 on there. Um, but if we were going to do that, so you had mentioned um, in that uh, that uh, that Renucci had suggested a certain uh, DO2. It was, th was it 280 mLs per kilogram, right, or per meter squared. Yeah. 230, 280 mLs per meter squared, so 560 for a 2 uh, meter squared patient. Mm -hmm. Okay. So should we know that number and should we be documenting that number and then measuring it when we go on bypass? We should be mm -hmm. trying to. But in order to do that, we have to know what the oxygen, mm -hmm. the arterial oxygen content is mm -hmm. to know what our DO2 is because we can't continuously monitor DO2 because we would have to continuously monitor hemoglobin at the same time. Okay. And, uh, and you're an advocate of higher perfusion pressures. You don't like the perfusion pressure under 50, 60, 40. Where do you, where do you sit so I try when to you do a case? So I try to look at the 
location space parameters like when they first come in I try to see I look at their um, charts too if they're hypertensive um, and then I base it off of that so if the patient sits at like higher pressures like a 70 80 I will give them that higher pressure mm -hmm. otherwise I will try to maintain it between 60 to 80 60 to 80 what do you do when uh, they're getting back bleeding through the coronary and they're yelling that they want the perfusion pressure down? I just go ahead and start decreasing my either my flow or either I just tur turn mm -hmm. my anesthetics on a little bit mm -hmm. for a few minutes. And then once I see the pressures down, then I will go ahead and decrease it mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. go back to my. How do you balance? How do you decide? Um, they, need to do th they need to do what they're doing. They can't see. Mm -hmm. How far can I actually go? For how long can I actually go down? Um, but they're really getting frustrated because they're really bleeding up there and they can't see from collaterals, bronchial circulation, whatever the case may be. doesn't make any difference. They're, they're, they think they need the flow down in order to be able to do what they're doing, the flow and the pressure down in order to do what they're doing. How long do you do that for? What are you looking at? Are you considering where you're at in the case? Are you cold? Are you warm? How do you address them if you think this is too low? What do you say? So, good question. <laughs> so at that point, I'm going to be first looking at where I flow. I'm going to go ahead and make my move of, if I can, increase my vacuum so I can start draining or increase my um, suckers so I can get more return back. If that does not help, hap helps, then I can look at my temperatures, how cold that patient is, and I can reduce it down a little bit. And I can see if my m pressures maintain and also my SVO2 maintain. Mm -hmm. If it drops a little bit, I'm okay with it. But if it drops dramatically, I am not okay with it. Mm -hmm. And I will address that to the surgeon. Mm -hmm. Like I how? What would you say? Tell me what you'd say. I will pretty much tell him that I need, n I am flowing at this index and I cannot go lower than this mm -hmm. because of his SVO2 mm -hmm. decrease. Mm -hmm. Okay, look, I just need it down a little bit longer. I just need another minute. You yeah. okay with that? We can do it for a minute if my temperatures um, mm -hmm. allow me to. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if it's like my pressures are super low with the pr uh, flow, then I will mm -hmm. address it with him that I'm mm -hmm. sorry, I cannot. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then they turn around and say, but Ramsha. <laughs> The patient's going to die if I can't fix this. I need the flow down. Then I can decrease the temperature for a few minutes and then decrease the flow. Okay, good. <laughs> can't wait to do a case with you when that happens. I'm going to tell them to do it. Now, just on purpose. I'm going to say, okay, this is what I need you to do. <laughs> Make sure we're nice and warm, too, when we do it. No, I mean, that's going to be some. That's gonna be a fun day. I'm going to do that with Batoyer. Don't. Mm -hmm. I'm not looking forward to that. Okay. Cases. Pressure <laughs> equals flow time resistance, but flow equals pressure divided by resistance. Yes. You, you, I, I, I was like, I, I knew, I knew there was a times in there. Okay. It's pressure equals flow times resistance. Flow equals pressure divided by resistance. So you were right. I somehow, I, I don't know what I was thinking. Okay, I have no idea what you I was know, thinking. You know, Joe, I learned. I did it just to throw you a curveball. You know, Joe, one thing I learned. Yes. Is you got to be aggressive behind that pump. Yes, you do. And I learned it from one of the best perfusionists that I shadowed in Waco. And he told me, he was like, if you don't like it, you tell them because you own this. That's right. So Who was that? <laughs> oh, God. Joe. Jo His name was Joe, too. It figures. <laughs> Okay, Joe from Waco, you have a, you got a question? Bill is here? Yeah, we're going to take a, we're going to take a short break. We're going to take a short break. So we're going to excellent work. Thank you. I think you did a fantastic job. Very pleased, very proud of you. That was very good. Thank you. And we'll do very many more. So I'm looking forward to it. Okay, so we're going to take a short break. We're going to come back. And I'm going to give another little short talk on advancements in perfusion, the future of perfusion, if you will. And then we're going to have a really neat session between you, myself, and our next guest, Bill Watson, who I'll introduce when he gets in here when we come back from our break. And we're going to have a real interesting talk on the economy of perfusion.
why do we do what 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 are the choices we have what's really out there what are your employment options what are the hospitals options what are companies goals what are individuals goals what are people why do people work for one uh, type of setup versus another type of setup hospital employed contract group employed large group employed small group employed working for the surgeons working for themselves independently how do we do what it is we do because at the end of the day even though you don't do what you do for the money and neither do i we still want to be paid for our efforts because that's how we live right and uh we have studied really hard for and we have had lots of sleepless nights and we have it's been a it this is a a passion but I want to be paid too, okay? And uh, I feel like I deserve to be paid. Yeah. And you should too. And you know that's that's uh, that's that's what makes the world go round. So uh, we're go it's going to be a very interesting conversation. So we're going to take a uh, ten minute break, if you will. Now, also, David told me to tell everybody, um, we're actually going to you can keep that. We're going to shut the stream completely off. Because this was Perf Web 68. Normally, when we're doing a long uh, day with a lot of different sessions, we'll just do a break, um, and then we'll come right back to the same show. But in order to be compliant with everything, we have to actually stop the stream completely and then restart the stream on YouTube, FaceTime, Twitter, all of that kind of stuff, um, the social media platforms and restart it for PerfWeb 74. So I'll have to kind of do quickly opening remarks again, but we're going to be very quick in doing that today, and we'll get everything done by, uh, by I'm sure, 5 o'clock. Thank you all very much. Ramsha, yes? So is the end of 68? This is the end of 68. Okay, so what is the password? Yes, this is the end of PerfWeb 68. So Ramsha Azmat, I want to thank you. Excellent lecture. I'm always happy to have you, and you have been, I am so incredibly proud of you and so incredibly humbled to call you my colleague. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll be back in 10 minutes for Perp Web 74. For Perp Web 74. <laughs>